Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Anderson Ayn from uh, since uh, recently a uh, postdoc at the University of Waterloo here in Canada. And he will talk about uh, non negative unimodal matrix factorization. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have everybody. Today I will talk about a thing called NUMF. It will be a joint work with Nicola Ginis, Arno, and Hanks. And the content is what the heck is NU? Why NU? And then, of course, we have the matrix factorization problem. We will have a problem need to solve then. But I'm not going to talk about how to solve it today. Uh, that will be in my other presentation in another conference. This is a linear algebra conference, so it's more important to talk about the theory. If you're interested on the, how to solve it, you can go to the other conference or, yeah. So as a common fact, you, can, you may have uh, seen this in the first uh, invited plenary talk today. That is, this is a inverse problem. And probably you will consider inverse problem with a regularizer or the constraint that is a set C. And commonly seen regularizer will be LP norm, sparsity, induced norm, TV norm, smoothness, more negativity, cone, blah, 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 blah. And today I'm going to talk about a very special thing that I think very few people have heard of it or even consider it's called something called unimodal structure. Uh, this word is very similar to something called unimodular structure, which I'm not going to talk about the unimodular structure, but unimodal. So what the heck is unimodal? Basically, it means your vector looks like this. There is a rising head and a falling tail. That means for your vector, let's say you have a vector A. A1 is smaller than A2. A2 is smaller than A3, blah, 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 go to a value AP. And then starting from AP, the inequality sign changed its direction. And then you have this. And this is called unimodal with the zero is non-negative unimodal. So these four are four examples of annual vectors. Here, this is typically annual vectors, a Gaussian wave or um, whatever probability distribution wave or a ladder signal or even a horizontal line. They are all NU. So that means what? That means I'm going to factorize a matrix subject to a non-negative unimodal constraint. In order to do so, we need to categorize what the heck is this NU set. So by definition, a matrix, a vector, a vector X is NU, if and only if there is a P such that this crazy inequality is true. So by notation, I write it like this. So that means if a vector is inside this U matrix, U, U, U set, then I call it unimodal with the P here. So this is the notation. In general, we don't know the P. We don't know this P, we don't know. So I will just write it like this. That means I don't write a P here. So it means R, the X in RM is NU, but P is unknown. So we don't know what is the position of changing the sign. So here are some facts. This set is convex, but this set is not. So what, what is the differences? This set, is the set we know the P. So that means for this inequality, we know where is the change of the sign. For this one, it's the set of NU vector, but we don't know the P. So actually this set is equal to the union of all the NU set with known P, that is the K here. This set is non-convex, why? Because this set is convex and union of convex sets is in general non-convex. For example, this is a, NU vector, this is also an NU vector. Their union is not an NU vector. So that's trivial. But here's the interesting thing. If the gap between these two NU vectors, that means the gap here, getting closer, closer, closer to each other such that they are consecutive integer. In that case, this union is convex. So that, that's this. And vector X is NU, even only if there's a P such that X is inside the union of these two set and the P is different by one. So this set is convex. And remember, this U represents uh, inequality, like this, a set of inequality. So now we have union of two sets of inequality. So we can write that down as this system of inequality, which can be represented by this matrix times a vector inequality. So that means this whole thing 
is characterized by this matrix U, which is basically a bunch of one and negative one on telling you the sign, and then the rest is zero. And this matrix is full rank. So that means what? That means we now have a very special NMF program. So recall works NMF, NMF very simple. You have an M, you factorize as W times H and W and H are non-negative. But now I have even more constraint. So the columns here has to be NU vectors. So this is the constraint. So this is the NUMF optimization problem. Well, last you can you will see, okay, there's another constraint here. This is just normalization. So you don't need to worry about this guy. So now you can see that the difference between NUMF and NMF is that we now have the extra unimodal constraint. That is the vector here is not just non-negative, but also non-negative unimodal. And this can be expressed by this inequality for all the column J. So we have R of them. So we have R of this unknown PJ. This is the difference between NMF and NUMF. Now we have additional R of the integer unknowns. So you may wonder how to solve this problem. Well, of course, there are ways to solve it. The basic idea is BCD. The details on how to solve it, I'm not going to talk about in this talk because not enough time. You can refer to all my other talks. So the more important thing or the interesting thing that is uh, more suited for this conference is about the linear algebra. That is, when the solving this problem give you unique solution. That is, suppose I have some matrix W and some matrix H, and such, say, let's say is a matrix bar and then W bar. Let's say these two person multiply each other, give me the M, and this W fulfills a non-negative unimodal constraint. My question is, will solving this guy recover this? Notice that this is a non-convex problem, but it's, it's not just a non-convex problem, but also block non-convex problem. In NMF, if you fix W, that means you consider W is a constant and you solve it on variable H, this is a non-negative least square. So this is a convex problem. And in NMF, if you don't have the non-negative unimodality constraint, Solving on W, that means you fix H, is also a NNLS, a non-negative D square, so it's also convex. So NML is actually a non-convex problem, but block convex. But for this NUMF, this is a non-convex problem and also block non-convex, because as you remember, this set is non-convex. As I show here, this set is non-convex. So the subproblem is also a non-convex. So this is actually a very difficult, much more difficult problem to solve. And furthermore, suppose I solve this solution to uniqueness. There's a, some definition of uniqueness. What I mean uniqueness is this essentially unique. That means you can always multiply a matrix in between this W and H. So let's say I have a matrix Q and this Q has to be invertible so I can have Q inverse. What I'm saying essentially unique is that this Q is nothing more than a scaling matrix multiply a permutation matrix. So that means as long as the Q is just a product of scaling and permutation, I consider they are unique. So in this sense, I would say W1 and W2 are unique solution and I would regard them as the same solution. So what I'm saying here is when we were solving this problem, essentially unique. That is Q is only permutation or scaling. So this is core identifiability problem in NMF. And it turns out to study this problem, this is closely related to the support of NU vectors. So what do I mean support? Suppose I have a vector X is NU. So this is the vector X. And this is my drawing. Suppose I plot the vector X like this. So here is zero, here are all of zero. So this part is the non-zero part, and I call it support. So this is the notation. Support of a vector is the set of index that the element is non-zero. So there are two very simple facts. First of all, this support is a subset of this one to n set, in index set, of course. And because this is nu vector, nu vector means there is no internal zero. 
So that means I can always write the support of an NU vector as a close interval A, B. So in that case, this is A and this is B. I can always describe this support by two integers. And then what are the relationship between two NU vectors? You can actually have four different kind of relationship because we are talking about support. So it's possible that their support are strictly disjoint. That means for this vector, the support's here, for this vector, the support's here, and there's a zero in the middle, so they are strictly disjoint. And of course, if they just touch each other, that means there's no zero, this is adjacent, or they can overlap like this, this is overlap. And in this case, this is partial overlap because this is a support for the blue one, and this is the support of the red one. This region here, they have overlapped the support. And lastly, of course, you can have complete overlap. That is one of the vector is the support is totally inside another vector. So these are all the possible uh, interaction between two and your vectors. You cannot think of anything else. So to study this identifiability, that is when the solving this problem give us unique solution is related to the support. And support, there are four types of uh, interactions. So all this stuff actually related to a question that's when does conic combination preserve NU? So why conic combination? Because for NUMF, this is the NUMF problem. And you remember this, this is actually a special case of NMF that is the matrix H is non-negative. So you're actually multiplying the coefficient here to the columns of W. Because the coefficients are non-negative, so you don't have linear combination, but conic combination. And now we are talking about NU. So you want to know when does this conic combination preserve NU? That is, suppose we have two NU vector X and Y, they are NU vector. Find alpha such that this Z is also NU. Well, in general, we should find alpha and beta such that alpha X plus beta Y is NU, but since we can always divide the alpha beta by one of them and then we normalize one of them to one so we can have this expression. So that means if conic combination preserve two NU vectors, then problem 5.5 .5 has solution. So this is the, the, the thing we want to think, keep in mind. And there's a trivial fact. If X, Y are strictly disjoint, then this problem has no solution. Well, that's it because let's say you have these two vectors. There's no way you have a conic combination of these two vectors such that the result is NU, right? There's no way because there's an internal zero, yeah? So no matter what number you multiply them, there will always be a zero there. And this does not fulfill the definition of NU. So for this case, no conic combination will preserve NU. And that means for all these three cases, there are some alpha beta such that the combination of these vector will be an NU vector. And that's not what we want because we want the solution to be unique. So this is the, the idea behind the study. So the first of all, something very trivial that is suppose you have two strictly disjoint the NU vector that is the red one and the blue one. So they are disjoint. So their support A, B, the A, Y, B, Y and A, X, B, X, there is something in between. So in this case, we have a very trivial result that is uh, no matter what kind of H, no matter what kind of matrix C for W and X, as long as the matrix of W, the column fulfill this condition, and as long as H, H is not zero, it's some positive number, then we can recover the NUMF exactly if we solve the problem. So this is trivial, but of course, uh, the question become more less trivial. What happen if the two vector are not strictly disjoint. For example, these two vectors, this is x, this is y. This x just stop at b and then 0, 0, 0, 0 here. And this y just start at b plus one and then 0, 0, 0 here. Unfortunately, if you pick an alpha that is small enough, the combination of these two vectors will always be NU. That is this vector. And I zoom in here, you can see this is the part because you just compress this guy low enough, it will just continue the monotonicity here. So this is still NU. So that means this is just a long chunk of word. Basically, it means if you have a if you have this kind of situation, if you can always find alpha 
that is small enough such that this z vector is NU. So recall what we want. We want to say that solving this problem recover the solution. So suppose now the columns of W are all adjacent NU vectors. So that means what? That means we cannot have alpha that making the Z, that is a, another, any combination become MU, we cannot allow this to happen. So we have another theory. So the theory is that, let's say W is NU and adjacent. That means the column are adjacent. And then H is just no negative. And then we need something called independent sensing. That is, as long as for this any two pair of NU vector, if this is true, then they have to be sensed in different data set. And this translate to the matrix H that there's some specific sparsity pattern because you have some specific sparsity pattern, then that means the, the W are sensed in the data for different data point and they won't appear at the same time. And because they don't appear at the same time, so when you solve the optimization problem, you have to minimize it to exact for recovering the ground truth that they, the W will be recovered. These are just a long chunk of uh, words, so I'm not going to explain that. And then what about the overlap? For example, I just talked about this join and attention what about overlap. That is the support overlap like this. Here's an interesting theorem. That is, if you mix two non-fully overlap, that means this is not okay. And this is not okay because these two are the support of fully overlap. The blue one is all inside the red one. This is the red one inside the blue one. They are no, no, but for this case, this is okay. Then this is saying that if you mix, you have two X and Y, they are N U. And let's say you have U, you have, you have, no, no. Let's say X, Y are generated by U and V. All of them are N U. Suppose you want to write it like this. And suppose they are not fully overlapped. Then you can either have u equal x or v equal y or vice versa. This means if you demix two non-fully overlapped and your vector, they can never mix together. And you can always decompose them perfectly, not numerically, perfectly, exactly. This is the proof and I have no time to talk about it. Basically the main, main idea is to make use of the theorem. That is if a Q matrix is non-negative and the each inverse is also non-negative, then this Q is a permutation of a diagonal matrix, which is exactly what I wanted here. This is the definition of essentially unique. So this is exactly the, the theorem, but I don't have time. If you want to read it, you can read it offline. So what about other case? The previous theorem only talked about two annual vectors. In general, you can have three annual vectors or you can have many of them this is called our Spanner family, which comes from combinatorics. And the problem is this problem, NMF alone is already a very difficult problem. And now NUMF, you have integer unknown. So actually these are all open problems, which is very difficult. And lastly, uh, I have some simulation results. So I just talk very quickly. So suppose you have three NU vector looks like this. They mix together to form this data. Here is showing that by solving the NUMF problem by some algorithm, you can recover the ground truth because this is the distance of W to the true ground truth W. And you can see they are going down monotonically. And why they are different grid? Just because the algorithm make use of something called multi-grid. But this talk, I'm not talking about algorithm, so you can ignore them. And what about application? Yeah, why would anybody study this NUMF? Because of course, there's application. The reason is because there are some application on chemistry. For example, these are some data set on Belgian beer. Actually, this NUMF topic is, uh, I discovered it when I was visiting, visiting KU Leuven when I was having summer school there. And then there's a, there's a person on studying Belgian beer saying that they try to decompose the component in the beer. And you have this kind, of, this kind of graph. And then they can look up to the table. For example, this kind of data, you decompose it as by NUMF, you can see these are single picked up signal. So you can go to data book and see which is which chemical. And then you can have a bunch of application. But if you solve it by NMF, no, you can't do that. They mix up, they mix up, and that's it. And because of time, I have to stop now. So in conclusion, I talk about a very funny problem called NUMF, and I talk about briefly on the identifiability. That's all.